orders, right? Because sensible people follow sensible orders. So you have to make stupid things to test whether people jump when you click your fingers. Do you see what I'm driving at sure. here? This is a behavioral training laboratory experiment, and for it ran brilliantly from the point of view of management, not for human values, but it ran brilliantly from about 1910 until ah, 1960, 65. What began to happen then is this immense imaginative advantage we had over the rest of the world dried up, and you can measure that by uh, a curve of, of the, de the declining curve of patents granted to Americans. In 1939, we had, get ready for this, 92% of all patents granted on planet Earth. Wow. But, but by, <laughs> where are we now, <laughs> 2011, we have 22%, and the curve is steeply downward. So count on the fact, if you check back 20 years from now, it's going to be down in the 10 somewhere. Really, it's profound. Why is it that so many of us associate success with schooling? Well, once again, we're conditioned from every corner of society, even journalism, that in theory at least has the has the job, the task of telling truth to power, simply picks up the bits and pieces uh, that pass to them. They don't often stitch them together in any new combinations. For example, you would be hard-pressed if your life depended on it to find any evidence, documentary evidence, that tests, standardized tests, measure anything at all except your grade on the next standardized test. And how come we're blowing $50 billion a year and about 10% of the school year on them? What's it what about? What does it matter with you get a good grade on a standardized test? I don't know you from Adam, and I know that never in your life when you had a decision to make, did you ever ask the people that you were trying to decide whether to hire or work with what their standardized test? No one does. No one does because on some sane component in our my little compartment in the back, we know the information's worthless. It doesn't measure anything. There have been a hundred major studies over the 20th century, very expensive ones, trying to find out what exactly, what credibility you could put in a standardized test prediction, and the answer is zero. They can't find any. Some of these expensive examinations find a negative correlation. So what are they doing? Why are they continuing to keep it as an integral part of education? Why? All right. We're going to elect you instantly, overnight, to the California legislature. And, and, and you're a sensible woman, you know. You're not an ideologue. You know you have to go along to get along. And uh, it, when you, whenever you try to raise an argument against these, your colleagues say, really, Kim, could we save that for another time? Not because they're evil conspirators, because they're in the same boat you are. Whether they get reelected or not depends entirely on whether they look good. Not on whether they do good, whether they look good in office. And taking up issues like this doesn't make you look good because the only person with the money to make you look good or bad are the testing companies and they immediately move to discredit you not necessarily on your stance on tests that you know we've we've constructed an apparatus sort of like a giant ocean liner that is asked to turn 
180 degrees in the in the next mile. Well, it can't do that. Who's pulling the strings behind the companies that are invested? It's a brilliant in question. Thank and fortunately, the United States Congress, twice in the 20th century, asked itself that question. Once in 1915, those of you with... Uh, uh, a pen and paper and a good relationship with your librarian, the Walsh Commission in 1915 set out to answer that question, who is pulling the strings in schooling? Because there was an awful lot of uh, uh, concern about the changes that were taking place in American schooling. And then once again, in 1959, was the Reese Commission, R-E-E-C-E. -E -E. He was a congressman from Tennessee. And that one came very, very close to uncovering the whole truth. But as it was preparing its final document, the, a, a, a firestorm of the ugliest criticism burst out behind the scenes from people in every major institution to stop these maniacs from printing what they've learned. And so, because that pressure extended into the families of the commission, even though they were leading Americans, every one of them, they disbanded, and it was only through the courage of the counsel for the Reese Commission that we got a document published with their final notes before they wrote up. Both of these commissions, separated by, uh, what was that, 45 years, came to the same conclusion, that American schooling is controlled from the project offices of about 12 major corporate foundations in 1915, 1959, same thing. And that international input was coming from an organization still in existence right near where I live in New York, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they were pumping in uh, the international uh, input into our schooling. But essentially it was the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the Astor Foundation, the Vanderbilt Foundation is just beginning to make a pattern. We are not talking about a conspiracy here. We're talking about people looking out for their own interests. You cannot have a mass production economy centered around giant corporations unless the public can be convinced to spend everything they earn and to shop, you know, <laughs> year-round. You have to live for shopping. What, how does that affect school curriculum? Well, probably the single most attractive uh, uh, secular philosophy that the upper classes of the world have embraced for 2,000 years is the, the Stoic philosophy, that there's nothing you can buy with money that's worth having, and there's nothing you can command with your physical power that's worth commanding. Now, I mean, that's John Gatter's shorthand, but Marcus Aurelius's meditations carry the, uh, the, the gravitas of that brilliantly well. Okay, how would that sit with a mass production society if schools were to devote themselves to showing, now it wouldn't matter if they showed rich kids, but to showing kids of average means not to worry because nothing worth having can be purchased. And nothing, you know, nothing uh, that power can do to you uh, will hurt your, your spirit at all. You can have a great life and not have power or money. 
how exactly would that drop, that penny drop into the, you see what I mean? Absolutely. And you asked this great question yourself. You ask many of them in the book. 